All right, so welcome to Kalmekak Netzawalpili. Today, our lecture uh, is going to be on uh, Yopo, and we're also going to be talking a little bit about shamanism. We've talked about shamanism before, but we're going to be talking about the topic a little bit more. We haven't really given a, a good overall uh, summary of the topic. We talked a little bit about it with Professor Adam Pave when we were discussing uh, the, the Kukion. And so we're going to kind of go back to that topic. It's it's a topic that comes up quite often in in this subject, and so we're spent. We'll spend a little bit of time. I welcome. Uh, we'll spend a little bit of time on um, shamanism as well toward the end. So let's start by going to uh, South America here. In fact, I think I need to start right here. All right. So we're going to travel to South America right now. We've talked about South America before in some of our lectures, and we're going to go back there. It's a it's a land that has a, a very special place in my heart. I lived in Venezuela for a couple of years in the 1990s, and I became very familiar with the culture and the people there and, and the use of plants. And it was a very good experience for me. And so um, talking about uh, the land and the people and the cultural practices of South America is something that's very special to me. In particular here, we're going to focus in on the Amazon uh, rainforest basin here. And this is a, a very interesting and special place in South America. South America is, is very diverse when it comes to geography, lots of extremely high, uh, tall mountains, incredible jungles, beautiful beaches. You know, you've got the, uh, the plains and all kinds of uh, diverse geography. Uh, but for our purpose, uh, the Amazon basin is a, is a very special place for the study of the use of plants. It has uh, an incredible uh, biodiversity, quite possibly the greatest biodiversity in the world. We're talking tens of thousands of uh, individual species of plants and animals. And uh, maybe to put this into context, I think we've talked about this before, but if you look at, say, the New England area in, in the United States, you have a, a diversity of maybe 1,500 unique species of plants. And so compare that 1,500 in New England to, you know, 30 or 40,000 uh, different types of species of plants, unique species. Uh, and that kind of reveals the context there of an incredible diversity of plants. And lots of different medicines have come out of uh, the Amazon. Um, and the indigenous people of the Amazon uh, have quite possibly the greatest or most developed or specialized knowledge of ethnobotany in, in quite possibly in the world. I mean, there are accounts of individuals uh, being familiar with uh, up to thousands of different types of plants and all of their different med uh, medicinal or magical uses. You know what, I don't know why, can we pause this maybe real quick? Does anyone know why my face isn't sh showing up? All right, so we were saying that the, the, the people that live, the indigenous people that live in uh, the Amazon have an incredible knowledge of plants and the different species of plants, their different uses, et cetera. And so it really becomes a good example for us to, to understand how plants should be appreciated and used with knowledge and wisdom. We're gonna focus in a little bit here. See, we're kind of, we're kind of reducing our scale here, narrowing it down. Uh, we're going to focus in on these two areas right here, the borderlands between Venezuela and Colombia, as well as Brazil. And there are a couple of different uh, uh, tribes here that we want to focus in on. That's not to say that members of different tribes in the larger area don't also have these uh, religious spiritual practices, um, but these give us some kind of concrete examples to focus in on here. And so the two different tribes that we're going to be looking at, or traditions, if you prefer, are the Sequati. And then we have an example on the left of, of a, a man, a Sequati man um, decorating his face. And then we, and the Yanomami. And on the right, we have uh, examples of the Yanomami. They're very, very similar in terms of culture. It's kind of like what you might see in the American Southwest, where you have different tribes with unique cultures and experiences and mythologies with a lot of crossover. And they, they share a lot of they have a lot of uh, practices in common, et cetera. We see the same thing in Mesoamerica as well, where you've got individual tribes with their individual practices, and they have something in common, which is usually referred to as a Mesoamerican religion or something like that. And so even though we're focusing in on these two tribes, that's not to exclude any of the other tribes. And in fact, a lot of what we're talking about, again, is, uh, is, um, is representative of the larger uh, picture, okay? All right. And so the lecture today is on DMT snuffs, and we're going to start with the snuffs and then we'll get to the DMT. And so um, the word for snuff is uh, almost always in this part of the world referred to as hape. And so we need to kind of talk a little bit about that word. 
um, some of the origins here, and then we'll get into some of the, of the specific types of uh, hape, and uh, in particular, the yopo hape. And so hape is a Portuguese word that kind of, that explains the, the difference between the pronunciation that we see up there on the right, hape with an H, and the spelling, which is starts with an R. And so in Portuguese, the R sounds like an English H. And so that explains it. And, and obviously, uh, the, the word R-A-P-E does not look good in English, uh, even if you do put that accent over the E. And so I've even seen a lot of people spelling the word hape with an H instead, precisely to avoid the confusion that might arise from, um, from the Portuguese and English um, differences. <clears throat> All right, so hape is the Portuguese word for snuff, and I don't know if you're familiar, but a snuff is usually some type of plant material that gets inhaled or insufflated into the nose, into the nasal cavity. Uh, and in the United States, we have tobacco snuff. It's, it's not a practice that's very common, in particular in Southern California, but in different places in the United States, it's more common. There are people that dip snuff, you know, uh, in the Midwest and the South, et cetera. It's a little bit more common. Usually people that are more rural prefer to uh, consume uh, chewing tobacco and snuff in particular. In, in, in the United States, snuff is maybe a little bit of a misnomer because snuff, uh, tobacco snuff, is usually consumed in the mouth uh, in the United States. But in other countries, in, in different traditions, in Europe in particular, uh, snuffs made out of tobacco or other things, tobacco mixed with other plants, are also inhaled through the nose. Uh, has anyone ever done a snuff through the nose? A tobacco-based um, no, no one. Uh, I've only done it a couple of times. I actually encountered it in uh, Morocco. I was in Morocco and um, my brother-in-law's brother, -in -law's brother uh, had a little, a little container of some type of powder and he was putting it on his hand and sniffing it. And I said, hey, what's that? What are you doing there? And he said, oh, this is tobacco snuff. And so, like I said, it's a little bit more common in uh, Europe. Uh, there's more of a tradition of inhaling tobaccos, you know, um, People had snuff boxes in the 1700s and 1800s, and today it's a little bit less common. Uh, but the tobacco that I tried in Morocco, um, uh, you know, sniffing it, insufflating it, was uh, was very interesting. It was very, um, it, it was like a tobacco product. Has anyone uh, used tobacco or nicotine, even vaping? Yeah, a few people. And so um, uh, nicotine in tobacco, either smoking it or or chewing it or or sniffing it or vaping, right, has some very identifiable psychoactive effects. It uh, it kind of gets a bad name, and uh, we'll talk a little bit more about this uh, in our last lecture of the semester where we talk about specifically about uh, tobacco. But just to kind of give you guys a little bit of insight, a little heads up uh, about tobacco is, is nicotine itself is a very interesting chemical. It's, uh, I've heard it's one of the very few uh, natural uh, drugs uh, that has a dual action. That's to say, it affects you differently depending on your mood. And that's a pretty remarkable thing. There aren't too many other types of drugs or substances that affect you differently depending on how you're feeling. In other words, if you're feeling a little bit down, if you're feeling a little bit lethargic, tobacco can lift you up. It can, uh, it can give you a little bit of energy. It can make the neurons in your mind fire a little bit faster. It's a stimulant. And so it has a, an uplifting effect. If you're a little bit nervous, right? Sometimes people uh, get nervous and you'll see them outside of a building or at work or something smoking because they're nervous. Uh, so if you're nervous or anxious, it will calm you. And so that's a really remarkable uh, effect. This dual effect in a plant like that is really something special. And again, it's quite unique. In uh, in terms of the world of drugs, and so when you when you snuff this, you know, when you sniff this, uh, insufflate this uh, tobacco snuff, it has a very kind of bright feel to it because it goes up into your sinuses. It kind of uh, it's difficult to explain, but it's it's kind of a clarifying experience, and it doesn't last very long. You know, a matter of minutes, probably no more than fifteen or twenty minutes at the most. Um, and so, but it's a very interesting substance. And so um, there is this tradition in Europe and other parts of the world of, of uh, sniffing tobacco. And, and uh, I don't know for sure. It's something that I should look into. Uh, but it, it might come from uh, 
from the Americas. The, the idea of smoking, right, it essentially comes from the Americas. And so this idea of sniffing tobacco-based products is most likely also originates in the Americas. Um, as far as the hape goes, uh, there are all kinds of plants that are used for, for um, to make hape. And they're, they're kind of, I guess, what you want to call them, different flavors, if you will. And I've got a list of a number of different plants here, and I'll just go through some of these. Some of these I'm unfamiliar with, others, you know, I, I am familiar with, and you probably experience the same. And so we've got all kinds of different admixtures. We've got um, Palo Santo, we've got Ajo Sacha, we've got Sanango, we've got Silver Yarimo, Kana, Paricatri, Tsunu, Kumaru, uh, Chakruna, we've talked about Chakruna before. Uh, that is the, the psychedelic, psychedelic aspect of ayahuasca. Uh, San Pedro, which is a mescaline containing cactus from South America, ayahuasca. We've talked about that in, in class before. That's the MAOI inhibiting uh, containing uh, vine that's mixed with the chacruna for the ayahuasca brew. Uh, but sometimes I've, all, I've also heard of psilocybin, people missing, mixing um, the magic mushrooms into the snuffs. Uh, cacao or um, guava or mint or cinnamon or eucalyptus. And so there's a, a wide variety of different types of medicines or plants that can be administered through uh, through the nasal cavity. And that's something that we should uh, be aware of as students of, of sacred plants is the different methods of administration, whether it's a brew that you drink, whether it's a, something that you smoke and you inhale, or whether it's something that's absorbed through the nasal cavity. Obviously, we're all familiar with the effectiveness of, of, for lack of a better term, sometimes you got to say it's snorting, right? Snorting. Uh, a snorting is a very effective way uh, to, to uh, get a drug, a chemical into your body, whether it's cocaine, crystal meth, et cetera. In this case, tobacco and other plants. And so it's a very extremely efficient way. And the onset is very quick. And the effects are, I think, probably more long lasting than um, smoking. Um, typically, when you're talking about smoking um, a DMT, it's very short acting. It, 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 you know, it'll last for five minutes, maybe, or something like that. Well, as far as I can tell, uh, and I've never had any personal experience with a uh, hape of any of these sacred plants, but it looks like it, it, it lasts for more like an hour or something like that. And so super fast onset, a good duration. Um, obviously, it can create all kinds of problems if you overuse a substance in the nasal cavity. After all, the nose is mainly for breathing, not for the administration of drugs. And so if you overuse that or abuse that, you can end up with all kinds of problems in your in your sinuses and in your nasal in your nasal cavity. And that's always, like I said, uh, something to be aware of as, as um, students of sacred plants. And so uh, here's the hape. Let's talk a little bit about um, Yopo in particular. There we go. Again, we talked about that. So this is the Yopo right here. And Yopo is a, a large shrub or tree. It has uh, any number of different names. I'm most likely going to be calling this Yopo for the duration of the lecture. The scientific name in Latin is Anadenanthra peregrina. And it's a plant in the legume family, uh, similar to beans, um, peanuts, uh, tamarinds, et cetera. And one of the important kind of qualities or features of a, uh, of a legume is that it has a dry fruit that splits to reveal what is technically called a pulse, all right? In other words, seeds, all right, if that makes it better for you. And so here we see a picture on the right there of those seed pods. Again, they're dry. They they it's a dry fruit, meaning there's nothing, there's no wet, there's nothing wet inside of it, like a you know, banana or a, a peach or something like that. And again, and they split open when they're dry in order to facilitate the dispersal of those seeds, etc. And the seeds really is, is what you're looking for here with the Yopo. Uh, this is a substance that has been used for probably 4,000 years. Uh, it's probably one of the oldest. Um, plants that has been used for its psychoactive uh, qualities right up there with, you know, there are indications that psilocybin has also been used uh, for that period of time or peyote as well. And so we're talking about an extremely long-standing tradition of using this plant in most likely some type of medicinal or magical, spiritual, or religious context. All right, the, the plant is... Um, 
Let's see if we have, here's the distribution of the plant. So we can see that it is primarily a South American plant, uh, but it also uh, extends a little bit into uh, the Caribbean as well. Um, and most of the spiritual use of this plant is again, found in the Amazon rainforest in the basin. And that's where you see uh, a, a wide variety of different indigenous groups using this plant. Uh, and that's where you see a lot of kind of the well-developed shamanistic uh, techniques being put into play there. The tree can grow up to 30 meters high. This is an incredible tree. I mean, look at that. Look how, how big that tree is. And they're pretty much everywhere. You can find them in woodlands and shrublands and native grasslands. It's a deciduous tree, which means it loose, loses its leaves uh, according to the season. And... Um, and I think that's probably it so far. Uh, before we move on to the next section here, any questions about anything we've talked about so far? Well, um, Kayla? There was a comment, it was a comment out of question when we were talking about uh, tobacco, how it kind of changes depending on mood. Uh, analgesic, what is this? Analgesic properties is what Daniel or Dan Danielle said. Uh, I don't know if that, yeah, analgesic. Uh, so, so yeah, so um, analgesic properties would be some type of numbing effect, mm -hmm. and I, I don't think that there is as much of a numbing effect with tobacco per se. Uh, you do see a lot of that. It depends on the substance, obviously. So, cocaine has incredible numbing properties. That's one of the ways you know cocaine is cocaine is by rubbing it on your gums. And the reason you do that is to see how much it numbs. The more the cocaine numbs your gums, the stronger, the more pure it is. And so. Uh, that is a property in, in, of some plants. It's not a property uh, per se of DMT, at least not in the ways that we that we associate with cocaine, in that it has a direct local numbing effect on the body. DMT might be more of a, I, I don't want to I don't want to say this exactly because I don't want you to misunderstand me here, but more of a spiritual numbing, more of a, more of a mental numbing, and we'll talk a little bit about that. There. Are, there are some different ways that it's been explained under the influences of of the uh, five meo DMT of, of Yopo itself is that it allows individuals to focus. In other words, it blocks out distractions. And so maybe Daniel, in that regard, it's numbing in that it allows you to to focus your spiritual attention. And so uh, I think that's probably the best that we could we could get uh, in terms of an analgesic effect for Yopo specifically. Uh, so good, thank you very much. Uh, let's see, anything else? Any other comments or questions? I have a question uh, regarding the Yopo, the snuff one. Um, taking it, how fast does that, do you get a reaction from that? Yeah, it's pretty fast. I would I would say probably a, a matter of minutes, a minute or two minutes or something like that, or maybe even less. Um, it's gonna be much faster than consuming orally. A medicine you know you if you take a tylenol you're not going to get headache relief for maybe 10 or 15 minutes or, or 30 minutes or more uh, because it has to go through the digestive system has to be processed through various organs and then it gets into the bloodstream well with with insufflation into the nasal cavity those mu mucous membranes just soak it right up and it goes right into the bloodstream and so we're talking a matter of minutes um for for you know peak effects to start and i would say maybe even seconds for the initial uh the initial expressions of the of the chemicals to be felt all right let's move this on here so we talked a little bit about the distribution of this plant it's it's essentially everywhere in fact it seems like uh, even though i wasn't really close uh to the amazon when i was in venezuela i was kind of more up in this area right here <laughs> I was essentially living between the cities of Maracay and Barquisimeto and a number of different places in between there. And so I wasn't really close to the Amazon, uh, but I think I even recall even back then when I didn't even know anything about uh, these sacred plants, it seems like I remember someone talking about, oh, look at this tree, look at these crazy seed pods. And these seeds are, are used for medicinal or magical purposes. And so, and I think I, like I said, I think I've even seen them uh, while I was in Venezuela without understanding fully uh, how important this tree was and the seeds were. All right, let's start talking a little bit about consumption here. 
Uh, here we've got a representation of uh, the form of the most popular, the most effective, and quite possibly the most important form of administration of this plant. Again, it's a snuff, and so it needs to get into the nose. And uh, what better way to get something into the nose than to have a friend of yours blow it into your nose? And so this gets it all the way in there, all right? Um, so there are kind of two main forms of administration. This one here is called a tepi, and a tepi is a reference to the tool itself. And so it looks like a little tube here or a straw, almost always made out of bone or possibly cane, some hollow tube, right? And there are all kinds of different types of these tubes. They're designed sometimes, homemade, crafted, uh, being sacred instruments of administration of a sacred plant. Uh, and so this is the two-person tepi. Sometimes they even have much longer um, tepis, uh, significantly longer, sometimes up to three feet long. And obviously they don't pack the whole thing full of uh, the hape, uh, but I don't know. It seems to have a more, uh, has more force when you're using these longer tepis. Um, but they're also kind of self-administered forms of hape. And those types of tubes are called curipes. And this is a, a self-administered tube, so it has a bend. It's a tube that has a bend. Usually it's combined, two different tubes combined by some type of a stone or clay or uh, another piece of wood, et cetera. And one piece goes in your mouth and one piece goes in your nose. And so you pack your little tube full of hape, you stick one end in your nose, one, one end in your mouth, and you blow it up into your nose. And so obviously that's not quite as efficient or effective as having someone else do it. I've also seen individuals doing it um, just with a small tube, not blowing it, but just sniffing it. And so there obviously seems to be a lot of kind of personal preference. It depends on your tradition. It depends on your culture. It depends on, um, uh, you know, kind of those aspects. And depending on those, you'll you'll choose one of these different ways or or whatever. Again, it's kind of like alcohol, lots of different ways to drink alcohol. You can take a shot, you can drink a beer, you can have a glass of wine, et cetera. Kind of depends on your preference. And so we see something similar to that uh, here with the hape and the yopo. So uh, why, uh, why is this plant used? What's it for? What's it good for, right? Um, let's start kind of generally and then we'll work our way specific here. So all kinds of formal rituals. Um, it's used very commonly in a ritualistic setting. Uh, whether that's a rite of puberty, so a young man or possibly a young woman, um, you know, taking the step to become a full man, a full woman, accepted in, in the tribe, etc., uh, might consume uh, yopo or hape, uh, different festivals, uh, etc. Usually there's some kind of formal uh, ritualistic setting. Uh, and if, if that doesn't make sense to you, maybe, maybe think of the consumption of champagne. You know, you don't just have champagne whenever you want to. It's usually for special events, you know, a toast at a wedding, you're celebrating some uh, special event in your life, et cetera. And so even though that's not a, per a perfect analogy, it gets us, I think, at least on the road to understanding how you would use some of these substances in a ritual, ritualistic uh, fashion. For example, in a toast, right, everyone has their flute of champagne, you say some words, you hold up your glass, everyone, you know, cheers, uh, whoever it is that you're toasting, etc. And then you take a drink. And so even with something like champagne and alcohol, there are still certain steps that you want to take certain steps that you that you're expected to take in this kind of ritualistic use. <clears throat> uh, but that's not to say that it's not used for recreation as well. And so this is one of the fascinating things that we see about these sacred plants is they have a very clear ritualistic use, but then they also do double work as being a recreational uh, 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 tool, if you will, right? To relax, to have fun, to be around other people doing the same thing. And so again, multiple uses, multiple contexts, very important. And one thing we didn't mention yet is that there's a medicinal value to these plants and Yopo in particular. And so uh, it looks like um, it's very commonly used for things as simple as headaches. You gotta, you gotta remember if you are living in a in a tribe in the middle of the jungle, you can't just run to the store and get some Tylenol. And so one of the ideas that we see over and over again expressed by indigenous peoples when referring to these sacred substances is 
we don't have modern science. We don't have modern doctors. It's going to take us three, you know, three days to travel to the closest clinic. We don't have the time, the, the whatever, the money, the, the ability, uh, et cetera, to do that. So we use the medicine that God gave us in our locality. And usually there's an idea that the creator gave this to us as a gift to be used with wisdom, to be used for healing, to be used for good things. And so we see that idea over and over again. And so it's used as a medicine uh, for things as simple as headaches, for things as simple as digestive issues, uh, for things as simple as respiratory problems. And I know it, it seems counterintuitive to think you're going to shoot a whole bunch of powder into your nose to help your respiratory system. That doesn't seem to make sense. But sometimes there's a little bit of magic in there. There's there, there's something going on that we don't fully understand. And the, the medicine works best in, in the area where it's administered. And so that's just something to think about. There's There's a little bit of mystery there. All right, it's also used for things like cleansings, clearing bad energy, to create clarity and focus, to improve relaxation, et cetera. And so we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second here. All right, specifically with these, okay, so what, what does Yopo contain? Yopo contains a DMT, a dimethyltryptamine. That is the most active ingredient in ayahuasca, in the ayahuasca brew. And so DMT is uh, is present in, in smaller amounts, uh, but nonetheless, it's there. Uh, it also contains 5-MeO-DMT, and this is the substance that's found in the bufo toad. We talked about this uh, last semester. And so uh, it's slightly different than regular DMT, right? DMT is very visual often, um, lots, of, uh, lots of visual hallucinations, lots of patterns, lots of colors, et cetera. Uh, 5-MeO-DMT, uh, it's maybe so powerful and so extreme, it, it's often associated with, with nothingness, with blackness and darkness, in that you take a high dose of this 5-MeO-DMT -E, uh, and you blast off, you dissolve, your ego dissolves, you merge with the universe into nothingness. I mean, that's a pretty remarkable experience. And so there are, there are a good amounts of 5-MeO-DMT. And then there's also something called uh, bufotenin. And that's also present in the bufo toad. And so we have a remarkable natural mixture of some extremely powerful substances all in the seeds of this plant, of this tree. Um, and again, a lot of this, when, we, when it comes to psychedelics and these sacred plants, a lot of it has to do with uh, dose. And so the different levels of dosage will produce different effects, whether it's something very mild, like a mild stimulation or a tingling, up uh, all the way again to this idea of blasting off, merging with the universe, having your ego completely dissolved and feeling like you're one with everything and nothing all at once. And that's a pretty remarkable thing again. All right, so we're going to look at the kind of these two different traditions here. Uh, we'll get to that in a second here. Is this idea I've, I've been talking about, okay, we're going to look at the Yanomami uh, tradition. The Yanomami's over there. Uh, it's the lower circle right there, so right along the border of Brazil and Venezuela. And this is one of the most uh, one of the most um, prominent indigenous tribes in Venezuela, the Yanomamis. Uh, and then we're also going to talk a little bit about the the Sequanis over there in uh, in Colombia, right? They're kind of in the the elbow of Colombia where it meets uh, Venezuela in the nook of Venezuela, right there. And uh, even though a lot of the practices are similar, there appears to kind of be slight differences between how these plants are used, how the practitioners are, are, are perceived, et cetera. Uh, in the Sequanis, for example, and a lot of this information comes from a really good uh, Channel 13 uh, in Colombia, a kind of mini documentary that I looked at. It's called Plantas de Poder plants of power and this one in particular was on yopo and um and they went someone went down there and and kind of spent some time with a practitioner and in uh in the sequani tradition they call themselves medico tradicional a traditional doctor and so they're less likely to use the term shaman at least from what i've seen and and they don't even uh, seem to use the term curandero and so for whatever reason uh, they prefer this term, a uh, traditional doctor. And um, 
And this is a this is a, an indigenous community that numbers in about the 23,000, a uh, population of 23,000, more or less. Again, partly in Colombia, partly in Venezuela. And uh, this gentleman that I saw, this practitioner, his name was Don Pablo Aristo Bonilla, and he worked with his son, uh, Manuel Andres, and they were both uh, traditional doctors, and they were talking a little bit about how the plant was used and the purposes, etc. And then this other tradition here is, is the Yanomami tradition in Venezuela, which might be more along the lines of what we would consider, you know, traditional shamanism. In fact, I think they actually call themselves chaman or shaman. And so uh, as we talk about how these plants are administered and some of the different effects, I'll kind of be bouncing back between these two traditions, the Sequani of Colombia and the Yanomami of uh, Venezuela. And uh, I'll be referring back to that. All right, a part of the mythology of the plant, I didn't really get into a whole lot of the mythology, but uh, but from what I've seen, most of these sacred plants have some kind of mythology, whether it's cannabis in the Hindu culture, uh, being tied to Shiva and being a gift given to Shiva, some of the sacred plants given to him to alleviate the ills and ailments and concerns of life, or whether it's, um, whether it's, uh, uh, pulque in Mesoamerica tied to the goddess Mayawel, this idea that there's some kind of mythology, usually tying it as a gift from gods to humans. And again, we talked about this last class is that with gifts, gifts should be appreciated and gifts should be used with wisdom. And so uh, kind of Inherent in the idea of these being gifts is this idea of proper usage, this idea of respect, and this this idea of wisdom. Again, I think I said last time is if someone gives you a gift, the worst thing you could do is just throw it in a in a drawer and forget it. You know, the best thing you could do is admire it, put it up there, put it on your desk, put it on your table, uh, use it for what it's used, what it what it it should be used for. And so the mythology in the Sequani uh, tradition is that it was it, the, the tree was produced. It was made. It was made by a woman. And I might get this name uh, wrong, but it's uh, Yani Luawa. And so I didn't get, again, I didn't get too far into the tradition and the mythology. But again, there's this idea of some kind of divine origin. Um, I don't think that she's specifically tied to a god or a goddess, etc., but if even if you're a human and you're making a plant, that's a pretty remarkable thing. That's a, that's a miraculous thing that 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 is, is not something that's common. OK, people don't just make plants. Yeah, I realize there are different strains and you can be inventive, you can crossbreed, etc. But even that requires an extremely high level of skill and knowledge of plants and how they're used and how they function. And so in the Sequani tradition here, uh, it, the Yopo is considered a sacred plant. Again, this idea of sacred, and we talked about this before, sacred means set apart, means it's not like everything else. A sacred place, uh, for example, a church, a shrine, a temple, etc., is not like other places in the, in the regular world. You're not supposed to do what you do in the regular world in a sacred place. You're supposed to be reverent. You're supposed to be quiet. You're supposed to be respectful. You wouldn't uh, just spit on the ground of a, of a sacred space, okay? And you might spit on the ground outside and no one would look at you twice. And so this idea of sacredness is this idea of set apart as special uh, for whatever reason, right? And our reaction or our interaction with sacred places needs to be in line with that. And uh, there are all kinds of problems when you when you disrespect sacred things, okay? All right, so it's a sacred plant. It's not for playing. And a lot of these expressions here are translated from Spanish, and so some of them might not sound very fluent in English. But, but he said it, they're not for playing. They're not for disturbing. If you see a tree and it's growing and you know that's a sacred tree and you're, it's right in the middle of the field where you want to plant something, maybe you should go around that tree. That's a sacred tree, okay? And so this again, this idea of respect, this idea of 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 appreciating uh, a part of creation because it's part of creation, but also because it has these incredible abilities and effects, magical or medicinal or ritual or whatever. And one of the things that, that uh, this uh, this practitioner Don Pablo says was that the plant helps him to focus on his patient. He says when you when you take this. 
it uh, you don't feel the heat of the sun. You don't feel tired from the long walk you just made. You don't feel tired from all the talking that you've done that morning. It, it removes the cares and, and concerns of the physical world. And what that allows you to do is it allows you to focus your spirit. It allows you to focus your spiritual energy on the patient. And so, again, this idea that he's a traditional doctor, this idea that patients would come to him because they don't have money to go to a doctor, because it's too far away, or whatever the reason. So they go to him because he's a doctor to be healed of an ailment. And we've already mentioned some of kind of the daily, you know, the day-to-day -day ailments that might be um, that might be healed here, headaches, digestive issues, respiratory problems, etc. But then there's also a very kind of spiritual aspect to this. Um, I like to kind of think of, of us as individuals. Uh, yes, our body is part of who we are, but there's other things too. There's our mind. And our mind is basically all of the stories that we hear, all of the stories that we tell ourselves, and all the stories that we tell each other. It's the it's the verbal often, right? Sometimes it's not, right? If you if you think of like um um what's his name? Steven Pinker. He's a psychologist who deals a lot with language. He talks about kind of a, the language of the mind, mentalese. It's kind of the the, agama, the the constellation of different ideas and impressions and, and memories and, and feelings that kind of make up uh, what we think about. Well, we've got to translate that into language. And so um, we translate that into language here. Uh, and so I kind of got off topic there a little bit. And so... Um, so this allows, so I think of the individual, right? The individual is, is, the, is, is the body, obviously. It's also the mind, the way we interact linguistically with the world, but it's also the spirit. And if that makes you feel uncomfortable, that's fine. When I say spirit, I, I don't mean anything per se Christian or Muslim or, or Jewish, you know, Jewish or anything. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not even really thinking about religion. So I'm not really thinking about soul, if you will. I'm thinking about the motivating force within you is the thing that gets you up in the morning. The thing that the thing that gets you out of bed to do work is not your body. You tell your body to get you to get yourself up out of bed, right? It's not your mind because sometimes you think in your mind, "Oh, I, I should get out of bed because I got this work to do," right? But then you don't want to. So that's not your mind that keeps you in bed. The thing that keeps you in bed when you need to get up is your spirit, is your energy, is your soul, is the is the energy inside of you. And so we are all comprised of these three elements, right? Your mind, how you think about the world, how you interact with the world linguistically, your body, how you interact with the world physically, being able to touch things, et cetera, but then also the motivating factor inside of you, the motivating power and, and force inside of you that leads you to do things. And if you have a strong spirit, you can get lots of stuff done. And if your spirit is weak or sick or whatever, it might be difficult to do those things. And so, um, Again, this idea is that is that the plant can can work, the medicine can work on all of those levels, on any of those levels, or any combination of those levels. And so a, a, a patient might go to a shaman or a curandero or a healer or a medico tradicional or whatever you want to call it. And there are lots of different terms here. And, and that's one of the problems with this topic is that is that terminology is a little bit slippery. Uh, they can go to a, a healer for any or all of these reasons. Like my spirit is weak. It's sick. I, I need medicine, whether that's psychological, whether that's physical, whether that's spiritual, et cetera, et cetera. And so healing can take place on lots of different levels. And I think an important idea here to consider is the difference between how Western modern Western medicine views sickness and the way that most of the indigenous populations around the world view sickness is that sickness for Westerners is usually, you know, viruses are involved, bacteria is involved, different types of things. It's very scientific. It's very kind of clear cut. There's always a physical origin. There's some, there's some physical uh, uh, reason that you're sick and we need to address that physical reason. Well, that's all fine and good um, because the body is part of who you are. Uh, but what about those other part, those other types of sickness? What about the sicknesses of the mind? And what about the sicknesses of the heart, right? Sicknesses of the, of the soul, of the spirit. What about those kinds of sicknesses? Well, magic plants can work on that level too. 
And that's one of the really remarkable things about these. And, and there seems to be some kind of connection between those three levels of who you are and bringing them all into line is a very powerful thing. So we talked about kind of the origin of medicine, or, or excuse me, the origin of sickness, right? What, what causes sickness in the Western mind, in the Western perspective? But then the indigenous perspective of sickness is almost always spiritual. You're sick because of something in the spirit world, because of some power, some influence that you can't even see. And that origin, because the idea of physical sickness comes from some type of spiritual sickness, is a very powerful thing and requires powerful spiritual medicine. <clears throat> All right. So um, I think, let's see, I think I have a few things to talk about here for the Yanomami uh, tradition is um, so when you talk about kind of shamanism, when you talk about these traditional spiritual medicines, you have to talk about that spiritual aspect because that's always mentioned. That's always part of it. And for the Yanomamis, they're, they essentially uh, in consuming a Yopo in particular is is that they're seeking to be closer to something that they call shapiripe or spirits of nature, the spiritual realm. Again, because physical sickness is tied to the idea of spiritual sickness or spiritual influence, then you need to work in the spiritual realm in order to cure illness. Uh, one of the ideas here is that uh, Yopo illuminates the mind. It reveals disease. As I mentioned, disease of the body, disease of the mind, disease of the soul. One of the interesting things that was said in this, in this um, mini documentary was he says that Yopo scares away external distractions. He says, espanta. It, it scares them away. So whether that's a physical or social or mental distraction, and again, we're talking about the healer, the healer being distracted because it's the healer that takes this. In different traditions, sometimes the patient will take these sacred plants. Sometimes it's the healer. Sometimes it's both of them. All right. But in the specific traditions we're talking about here, it's the healer that takes this medicine. And and if this sounds crazy to you, if you come from a Christian background and it sounds crazy to you, I understand. I also have a Christian background. Uh, but there are Christian backgrounds that will not go to a doctor and will try to heal people through prayer. And so this idea of spiritual healing leading to physical healing is not completely absurd in, in, in Christianity itself. All right. And so so here we have the, the practitioner, the shaman, the healer, the medico tradicional using the substance to focus their attention, to eliminate the distractions, to kind of create a tunnel vision, like a, a psychological tunnel vision, so they can put all of their spiritual energy, all of their faith, all of their prayers, all of their songs, all of their chants into their patient. It's like a way to purify. It kind of goes along really well with this idea that we've discussed in other classes uh, that's usually attributed to Stanislav Grof is this idea that psychedelics, the classic psychedelics, DMT, peyote, psilocybin mushrooms, ayahuasca obviously included in there, and DMT here, Yopo would be included as well. These classic psychedelics are non-specific amplifiers. They're just tools. They're not good. They're not bad. It's just a tool to amplify whatever skills and techniques and abilities the person that's taking them brings to the game. And so if you are a spiritual, spiritual person that believes in, in the spiritual realm, that believes in spiritual influences, both good and bad, if you have a, a special sensitivity to, to that type of thing, then these substances make you even more powerful. They give you even more ability. They amplify. And so that's kind of one of the ways that this is used by the healer to focus their attention, right? To amplify their abilities and to focus their attention on their uh, on their patient. Um, one of the interesting things too is, is uh, you know, a lot of times uh, uh, in, in some kind of Western 
religious traditions, whatever that might be. There's a lot of pushback against the idea of shamanism, the idea of kind of more traditional ways of healing, etc. There's a lot of association with devils, demons, and and um, the adversary, etc. Uh, and it was interesting to hear the response uh, because uh, this guy, Don Pablo, brought that up. And he said, you know, some people call me a brujo. They call him a witch, a witch doctor. Or some people call me a demonio. They call me call me a, a un diablo, a devil or a demon. He says, I'm not a devil or a demon. He says, this is this is tradition. This is my culture. Let me see if I can find exactly where he says this here. I'm looking through my notes. He he basically says, where did it? I don't see it. Ah, right here. So he says, it's a culture. It's a tradition. It's an inheritance. This is something I got from my ancestors. And I think maybe we're, we're a little bit slow to recognize the important in today's society with, with all the new stuff that comes out every day. We're very future looking and maybe we're, we don't look back enough to our ancestors, to the traditions of our forefathers and mothers. He says, it's an inheritance. I received this. He says, this is something that our ancestors left us. And so in addition to all the, all the other effects of this plant, right, the psychological effects, et cetera, the experiential effects of this plant, is that doing this is a way to make a connection with your ancestors. In other words, it builds intergenerational strength and vitality. When you sit down and do something and say, oh, my parents taught me how to do this. My grandparents did this before me. My, my great, great grandparents did this before. We've been doing this for 4,000 years. When you sit down and think of that, what you're doing is you're saying, I'm part of this tradition. I, and it creates a closeness between the people that came before you and passing it on to the next generation. It's a very a very useful tool. So just kind of like anthropologically, this idea of doing traditions, of having traditions is very important socially, anthropologically, and intergenerationally. I think that's something that, you know, often, often in the United States, we have kind of intergenerational conflict, right? Think of the 1960s, where all the hippies were saying things like, don't trust anyone over 30 years old. And now we've got a young people, a lot of young people talking about uh, the boomers and this and that. Mm -hmm. And the older generation say, these kids these days, they don't know what they're talking about. So there's always kind of been this, you know, little intergenerational conflicts and stuff. And I think this idea of tradition, of respecting your ancestors and your forefathers is something that, uh, that, that I think our society could benefit from. I don't think there's a problem per se with you know intergenerational conflict. I think a certain amount of that is okay and probably can't be gotten rid of. I think parents will always say these kids these days and and kids will always say, who are these old stuffy old people that I don't understand? And so there's always a little bit of that. But I think this idea of tradition is a way to kind of to to despite the conflicts, it's a way to make connections between the generations, which I I, I view as very valuable, very important. All right, so let's talk a little bit about what, uh, okay, we're going to get into shamanism a little bit too. We've got, uh, we're going to probably have to wrap this up by about 1215 because we've got another class coming in. So we still need to talk a little bit more about shamanism, some kind of some theoretical ideas. Uh, we need to talk a little bit more about the preparation of Yopo and some of the immediate effects as well. But before we get to that, uh, does anyone have any comments or questions so far? So far, so good. All right, let's talk a little bit about um, about how you. <laughs> now, I always hesitate. I'm so sorry. There's yeah, a please. Question is a comment. Let's take uh, a look. Shall I take a look? Yeah. It says, speaking of tradition and culture, is there records of how far back these traditions go? Thank you, Haley, very much for that. Uh, yes, and so. Um, there is often archaeological evidence with uh, with these substances. There is for peyote. There is for, um, you know, uh, in peyote, we found effigies. So uh, effigies of, of peyote buttons that were made out of mashed peyote and formed into the shape of the peyote cactus itself. And so sometimes there is archaeological evidence and we can we can find it. Right. And we can date it. If it's organic material, we can date it. And so there are um, there's evidence of peyote being used back uh, something like seven thousand years, 
maybe 6,000 years. There's evidence of, um, you know, psilocy possible psilocybin mushroom use in Algeria. We have cave paintings. And so sometimes they, they paint it, right? Sometimes we find their stuff. Sometimes they paint uh, their visions or representations of these sacred plant plants in um, in petroglyphs or in cave paintings, etc. And uh, sometimes we find their instruments. Uh, and so uh, I think we this is associated with like San Pedro and coca use is <laughs> we've we found their paraphernalia, if you will, to put it into modern terms. Uh, you know, trays, containers, pouches, uh, tubes, etc. And we can do microscopic analysis and we can find out, uh, you know, what substances they were consuming. In particular with Yopo, uh, they have found uh, archaeological evidence, Haley, of Yopo use going back uh, 4,000 years. And that came from the northern part of uh, Argentina. So a little bit farther south than the area that we're talking about today, if we go back to this map see if we can pull this up. So going back to our map here of South America, um, we've got Argentina way down here. So kind of the northern parts of Argentina, this is where the oldest Yopo use has been found, you know, but we're talking about way up here. And so obviously this is, uh, it has spread around, right? Anytime you've got a valuable commodity, uh, whether it's medicinal or magical or whatever, uh, people tend to trade those and they, they get around fast. And that knowledge spreads quickly uh, because valuable tools are are uh, desired by people regardless of where they live. And if you can trade for it, then you will. Uh, so good question. I hope I answered that for you. All right. So moving forward back up here, let's talk a little bit more about uh, how to make this. I always kind of hesitate when I am telling people how to make drugs <laughs> for obvious reasons. So uh, a huge part of this class, of, of, of this club, is responsibility, is being wise with knowledge, is, um, is treating things with the respect that they deserve. And you wouldn't be flippant in handling a firearm. So why should you be flippant in hand handling any of these sacred and powerful plants? Uh, it's, it's very similar. You can, you, can use a, you can use a firearm for evil, and you can use the firearm for good. You can use a powerful plant for good. You can use it for evil. Uh, obviously, the evil there is black magic, poisoning people, and uh, casting spells on people, sorcery, etc. Anything where you're invading another person's will, right? And that's a black magic. And so the idea here is anytime we talk about these plants, we talk about these substances, we talk about the process, to how to make them, how to use them, how to consume them, it's always with the charge of you need to be responsible. And so that's always the, the, the preface is, is, is knowledge of these plants, right? What do they say? With great power comes great responsibility. Isn't that what, isn't that what Spider-Man teaches us? <laughs> so go ahead. So with the uh, Yopo being more, it seems like a more isolated experience. How do they use this to connect with one another? Good. Uh, again, a lot of this depends on um, admixtures. And so sometimes you can add different plants to the Yopo for different effects. Uh, and it also depends on dose. The more you take, the more likely you are to blast off to, to nothingness. And in fact, usually that blast off to nothing, nothingness is not the objective of a healer. If you're, if you feel like you're in the middle of nowhere with nothing and you know linked to the universe, you might not be able to focus on your patient. And so it's usually smaller doses. I've seen some ceremonies online where the practitioner will, will take a small amount do some work and take another small amount and keep doing some work. And so it kind of is dose specific. It kind of depends on what you want to do. You know, uh, if, if you need to work with someone else, a patient, you might have to take less. If you want to do a deep probing psychological examination of who you are, what issues you have in life and how to make yourself a better person, you might need to blast off and experience what it's like to to be outside of your body or something like that, because those are all types of experience that people people associate with DMT. Yeah, please. Could it be compared to caffeine? Can you use caffeine? I think there's definitely a part of that. Uh, and I would say with caffeine in, in particular, right? It, it is, yes, that's, I'm tired. I need to wake up. Let's take some caffeine. But there's also a very strong social component to caffeine and coffee consumption. 
And so, and that goes back hundreds of years to Europe and the Middle East, is that uh, let's get together at the same time to do the same thing and let's talk. You know, they used to call ca uh, cafes in Europe penny universities. And so there is a strong uh, kind of a social component to it as well. And that's one of the things I've seen with Yopo in particular is there's a strong co like social component to it. It doesn't only have to be uh, let's take this for the for the psychological effects, uh, but there's also a social aspect to it. But but you're also right. There is also depending on the plants that you mix with it, kind of like a uh, like a. Um, an energetic boost, if you will. All right. Again, I talked about using snuff and how it had a clarifying effect in my mind. It felt like, it felt like, have you ever felt like your mind is cluttered? Oh, just so much crap in there and ideas. And it's been a long week and your, your mind feels jumbled. It's tough to think and things like that. Well, this was the entire opposite. Taking a little bit of that snuff, it made it clear. It felt like my mind was just open and bright and big. And so there is kind of like an energetic aspect to a lot of these plants. And I think Yopo is, is one of them. Um, again, yeah, go ahead. There is, uh, I don't know how casual it is, like wake up in the morning and take a big, you know, <laughs> and, and hit your Yopo, uh, but there is a recreational aspect to it. There is a, hey, what do you want to do? Let's, well, let's do some Yopo. Uh, and so it, it uh, there is kind of a, a more casual aspect to it. I think that's one of the fascinating things about these plants is that there's a, a, a huge spectrum of use. Everything from recreational, social, ritualistic, to very, very personal and uh, often experimental. And we'll get, get to that in just a second here with shamanism is that there's a strong experimental component to, to, to shamanism is let's see what this plant does, you know? And so again, a very broad spectrum of use, everything from uh, informal recreational to extremely deep and experimental and, and almost everything in between. Kind of going back to the idea that nicotine has dual action depending on how you feel is i think one of the great things about these plants is they can do lots of different things that's i mean that's a, that's a very valuable tool i mean, imagine just make the association to golf imagine if you had a golf club that could do everything from putt to hit a one wood you wouldn't need all the rest of those golf clubs if one club could do everything then that club becomes super valuable and super powerful and so these substances can do lots of things which means it's powerful it's kind of like language if the language if if, if a language that you're learning can do lots of things if it's apt for poetry as well as scientific description, as well as writing love notes, as well as you know taking notes in class, then that's a very valuable and powerful tool to use. And it behooves us, I think, as, as, as humans living on creation to understand all of the different uses of the plants and to be aware of them. And also, I think it's one of our main responsibilities is to be responsible with the power it's like it's one of the most magical experiences is when you show the universe that you are responsible with the power that you have guess what the universe gives you more power All right oh okay you did well as a student now i'm going to make you a teacher now see if you can handle that power well you did well as a as a teacher handling that power now i'm going to give you this other ability now i'm going to give you this other power and so not only the world and humanity rewards individuals that are good with their power, but the universe. If you want, if you want to say God, say God. If you want to say the universe, say the universe. If you want to say whatever, say whatever. It doesn't matter. It's 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 all the same. It happens. So it doesn't matter what you call it. So if you're responsible with your power, you get more power. The problem is power is corrupting, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And it's extremely hard to avoid that temptation to abuse your power. And that's something that we see in, in shamanism as well, is shamanism is power, is powerful, it can be used for good, but there's a temptation to use it for evil or for ill. All right. So um, let's talk. Uh, so I was talking about how it's, it, I always hesitate to tell people how to make drugs. Uh, and so here I am. I'm going to tell you how to make some drugs. Uh, so whatever. It's all on the Internet anyway. So might as well.
So, um, so you take your mature seed pods. This is from the Yopo tree. You remove the seeds. There's a small film around the seed. You remove that small film, kind of like a citrus seed. If you've ever prop if you've ever germinated a citrus seed, you you know there's like a slippery outer coating to the seed. You have to remove that. You remove that. You let them dry in the sun. They're kind of flat, light brown seeds. Again, they're called pulses technically, but I th they're just essentially seeds. You dry them in the sun, and then uh, you, I think, I couldn't understand what this guy was saying, is uh, his second language is Spanish as well. And so he was speaking with an accent, saying some words I didn't understand. But it sounded like he said, you mix it with ripe uh, yuca. And so you mix it with ripe yuca to kind of create a paste. And then you wait 24 hours. Uh, and then you take that kind of dried paste, uh, and you add uh, toasted, and this sounds crazy, but toasted snail shell dust. So you take a, the shell of a snail, you toast it in, in a fire. I heard someone say 800 degrees, but who knows? And I don't know how long. Uh, and then what you do is you take that shell and you crush it up. And what you're looking for, I think, is the chemical inside of the shell, calcium, most likely, is some type of base, a chemical base. We talked about this last time with coca, right? Is to make Is to make crack rock you take cocaine and you mix it with baking soda and that's a chemical base. And what it does is it changes the chemistry of the, of the cocaine and it allows it to be more readily available to you. And it makes it for a mm, stronger hit, all right? We also talked about it when you're chewing coca leaves to mix it with some ash, to mix it with some calcium. And that, uh, that base releases the alkaloids so that your body can absorb them easier. So you take uh, some of that, you smash up your snail shell, uh, and then you take that, it's kind of like a, a thick consistency. And I saw this guy hammer it flat with a hammer, an actual hammer. He just pounded it, right? Pounded it flat uh, into what he called an arepa. Arepa is essentially the South American version of the tortilla. So he made a little arepa, a little disc about this big. It's kind of a dark brown disc about this big. And then he dried it over fire. So removing all the moisture. And then once you had that dried, flattened disc of, again, yuca, uh, yopo, and, and um, the snail shell, then you take that and you pulverize it, all right? Smash it up, it's all totally dry and it'll smash into a very, very fine powder. And this is the powder that it, it's like this brown powder right here. And then that's it, and then you're ready to go. Um, as far as dosage, dosage goes, I heard people say you start with an eighth, an eighth of an ounce, with, I don't know how much that would be, but you know, a little bit. Uh, and then, or maybe it was even an eighth of a gram. I guess I should get the dose right, huh? <laughs> I don't use this stuff, guys. Uh, doesn't look like I wrote it down. A small amount is, in other words, use a small amount is what I would say. Uh, another thing that's always kind of weird uh, about telling people how to make drugs is that look at look at a um, look at how our government treats the knowledge tr treats this knowledge. Right, the Yopo seed is not illegal in the United States. I could buy a whole bunch of it right now if I wanted to. In fact, I don't know if I could buy hape, but uh, but but I could. I could have a Yopo tree if I wanted to in my backyard. I could have those seeds if I wanted to, and the seeds contain all of those stuff, all of those things. It's not like it's not like um, mushrooms where you've got. Uh, where you've got the, uh, what the heck do you call those things? They're not seeds. They're uh, the spores. Thank you very much. It's not like spores of mushrooms. Psilocybin mushroom spores don't contain psilocybin. And, but they're still illegal. They're illegal in California. You can't have them. The Yopo seeds contain DMT, 5-MeO-DMT, and buvotanin. All right? It's not illegal to have those in this country. But as soon as you start making hape, it becomes illegal. What does that mean? It's not the substance that's illegal. If it were, the seeds would also be illegal. So what is the government telling us is illegal? Our knowledge. What we know is illegal. And I don't know about you, but that sends a shiver up my spine. I do not think that the government, the people that are are leading this country, the people that are in positions of power over us and the institutions that they've created and the laws that they've passed should have the power to tell us what to know. That is uh, 
shocking, uh, disturbing, and upsetting in the very least. All right, so what's going to happen? You, you've got your powder. You're going to put it into your little, your kudipe, your tepi. You're going to blow it into your nose. What's going to happen to you? Well, you're probably going to feel like you got hit in the face with a two by four. That's what everyone says. It's, it's an overwhelming shock to the senses and the sinuses. Um, in your head, back here, up here, and here, everywhere. It's going to make you, oh, people, you know, uh, scream. Uh, it's it's uh, difficult. Imagine, like, the first time you ever took a shot of straight liquor, right? Uh, straight tequila, <laughs> straight whiskey, <laughs> scotch. Ooh, your reaction. Yeah. Right? After a while, you get to like it. But the first time, right, it was tough. Or your first beer. Uh, ee. Well, imagine that times, I don't know, 10 or 20 or whatever. And so the, the initial physical reaction is, is shocking. It's, it's overwhelming. This is a ton of, of dust, of polvo, of uh, going into your sinuses, right? Um, and so you're going to be overwhelmed with kind of uh, with, with a physical reaction, the immediate physical reaction. Uh, but then you're also probably going to have uh, a, a complete and total sinus, sinus clearance. It's everything, all of the mucus that's all up in your sinuses. You know, you've got sinuses all up in here and back in here and all around over here and et cetera. They're all just going to flush. All of that mucus, any congestion, anything that's in there, it's all coming out. All right. Where's it coming out? It's coming out through your nose. And it looks like it's pretty common for people to be and spitting and blowing and and it just releases all of that stuff. Your nose is going to run like crazy. You're probably also, especially when you, if you, cause, right, because the nose and the throat are connected. If you swallow that, and they encourage you to swallow it, uh, then you're going to start tasting uh, the um, the yopo. And then most likely you're going to have a feel upset to your stomach, desires to vomit, desires to have diarrhea, explosive vomiting, diarrhea, et cetera. Often this is called purging. All right. So to the Western mind, this sounds like, oh, you're getting sick. Uh, to the indigenous mind, this is you're getting rid of bad stuff inside of you. And um, even though it sounds kind of weird, it's like, how do you feel after you throw up? I always feel better when I'm done throwing up. I always 100 percent of the time feel better. And so there's something to that. OK. And so um, those are kind of the immediate physiological um, uh, effects. Uh, what are you going to see? What are you going to feel? What are you going to, you know, et cetera? Again, all kinds of different geometric patterns, lights, bright lights become brighter. Uh, you can see, right? One guy said, uh, he said, let's see, uh, he see the birds in different colors. He can see beings in the sky. He can see different things. This seems to make the connection between the physical world and the spiritual world uh, less less um it breaks down the barrier between the spiritual and the physical all right and this one uh healer said which i thought was a remarkable statement he said with such confidence i it, i thought i don't think i've ever heard a western uh, doctor say this he says i feel capable of curing whatever kind of sickness even the most complicated that there could be that's a pretty remarkable thing I mean, we don't, don't have a whole lot of time to get into shamanism here, but we do need to talk about a few things real quick. What is a shaman? Uh, it, it's, first of all, the word uh, is borrowed from Russian, and it probably comes from the Avinki language, which is right here. Right, This is all Russia here. So we've got northern latitudes. Here's the Avinki right here. This is an indigenous group of Siberia living way, way, way up in uh, close to the Arctic Circle. And the word shaman... Uh, is most likely from this Avinki language, but assuredly from Tunguskit, Tunguskit, and it got into English in the in the late 1600s. Um, and a, a shaman is a a spiritual practitioner. We don't have a really good, clear kind of definition of what a shaman is, and so there are kind of lots of different ideas, and it's used in lots of different ways, and so it can kind of be con confusing, but uh, kind of the general idea is a shaman is a person that gets in touch with the spirit world while in an altered state, and the altered state can come from consuming a substance, a plant, or it can come from meditation, chanting, uh, rituals of ordeal, or different ways, different ways to enter into an ecstatic state. Um, and again, if you're Christian, you think, oh, this has nothing to do with Christianity. I would say I would counter with what about all the Christian mystics? 
What about all those Christian mystics and saints, Santa Teresa, San Juan de la Cruz, etc., that have had ecstatic uh, uh, spiritual experiences? The only difference is they're not using plants. I don't know, you know, necessarily if that means they're different. It's this idea of communing with spiritual realms, of, of becoming close, of uh, finally attuning your spiritual senses to be able to do spiritual work. <clears throat> Um, and I think this raises a la the last point here I'm going to make, and then we're going to end here, is this idea that um, uh, is is this kind of a seeming incompatibility between Western science and the approaches of Western science and indigenous approaches is this idea of how did these people figure all of this out? How did they how did they know to mix the ayahuasca vine with the chacruna leaf to create the most potent brew, uh, the most potent psychedelic brew ever? Right? How did how did they know that they're supposed to take this seed, crush it up, mix it with some other stuff, and then blow it into their nose as a powder? It seems like you would have to do an awful lot of experimentation to land on that specific process that just so happens to be so effective in all of these different ways. And so Western science it has a lot of trouble with this. And there are Western scientists that say, uh, how did they figure this out? This almost seems impossible. And so uh, what's the response when you ask these uh, spiritual practitioners, how did you know that you're supposed to do this? Their response is the plants told us. Now, I don't know, you know like I said, I, I say this all the time, is Western science doesn't have much use for that answer. That is not, a, 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 that is not something that a scientist wants to hear. You know, Dr. Jesse Lemieux from the chemistry department isn't going to be convinced that the plants told these people how to do this. Right, but I'm not a scientist. I, I study humanities, and and I I'm 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 uh it it's not as absurd of a of a of a statement to me, because uh, under the influence of a lot of these substances, there is an incredible increase in the appreciation and recognition of the power of nature. I mean, just just imagine, right? Yeah, sure. You drink, a, you know, have a beer and watch the sunset, and it's nice. You smoke a joint and you watch the sunset. You have an entirely different appreciation for nature. And so with some of these substances, there does seem to be like a spiritual awakening and appreciation of the powers of nature. And so um, that's it. I, I, we don't have, uh, we can't get into any anything else because of time constraints. But I would just like to ask you, does anyone have any comments or questions before we end? All right, I'm going to stop online. Thanks for being here with us, guys, online. Let me uh, stop recording.